Anyone plant grass seed yet? Get your grass seed going, ready to go. Make that grass grow so I can mow it more. Ooh, that sounds like a bad plan. Oh, man. Well, I mean, I can see the value of Arizona. Just the rocks and the, you know. Well, welcome to those of you joining us online. We're glad to have you with us tonight as well. And we just finished praying over our offering. and We're getting ready to start tonight on page 71. We're going to be talking about Naomi and Ruth and the value of relationships. Now, we've been talking about relationships. He started out by talking about our relationship with God. He set the tone there. That has to be right. And then he talked about our kids, and we've talked about our family, our spouses. Now we're going to talk about our relatives. And it's a, it gets a little harder as we go. And, and if you have relatives that are resistant to the gospel, I understand that. I understand that. And, and, and the hard part is, is where is the line? Because if I stop telling them about Jesus, maybe I'm the only one telling them about Jesus. So if I say, well, I'm done with you because you keep rejecting the truth I'm trying to give you, that needs to be prayed through because there are times where boundaries have to be set. And, you know, somebody just refusing, they don't want it, they don't want it. No, yeah, I'm Okay. But does that mean we stop loving them? Does it mean we treat them differently? No, but but do we sometimes? Yeah. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you that what we, we eat tonight, Lord, that it nourish us spiritually, that it brings strength to us, it brings revelation to us, that it open, Father, things within our spirit that we haven't seen before that brings about change in our life. And then as that change takes place, Lord, help it to take place consistently, that we would work it until it becomes who we are. We thank you for it tonight. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. 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 Well, Naomi and Ruth, the value of relatives. We've studied the importance of a, re a relationship with God and examined the elements of healthy relationships. Then we looked at the marriage relationship as the most fundamental relationship that exists between two people. Now let's take a closer look at our relationship with our families or our relatives. The word relationships, the words relationships and relative are similar. Both refer to a connection or a kinship. No matter who we are or what we experience, we probably can remember a time when, we rel when a relative reached out to us with a helping hand or an encouraging word. Maybe a relative gave us an unexpected gift or needed support and assistance. Maybe it was just the reassurance that the relative believed in us. Many of us have treasured memories about our relatives. Do you have that? Do you have somebody that's spoken into your life that's, that's meant something to you, that encouraged you? I remember Amy's aunt, one of her aunts is a sweetheart. Her name's Carolyn. And uh, she sent a little card to Amy a few years ago just with some encouragement on it. And, it and it had just little notes and one of them I remember it said you are strong and that's it you can do this that blessed me you know so sometimes I think we just get so busy but remember the Holy Spirit will drop names in our mind for a reason there'll be times I just go hey talk to this person and 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 I may forget, we've all been there, I may be busy, okay, yeah, yeah, and it comes back to me again. And it comes back to me again. The Holy Spirit wants us, if he's trying to get us to speak or do something, he'll continue to prompt us for a while. Eventually. So we have to be sensitive to these things because I think we can be so busy, ah, they know how I feel. They know what I think. He says, I remember the first time I took my wife to a Hagen family get-together. In the Hagen family, there were 10 cousins born in a 20-year span. Add to that number all the aunts and uncles, moms and dads and grandparents, and Lynette was taken aback at the get-together because it seemed as if, as if everyone in my family talked at once. That was some kind of noise. Since that time, many of my family members have gone on to be with the Lord, but I still have many happy memories of my family. Family ties are strong. 
Often family members will join in other family members' struggles or arguments without even knowing or caring what the fight is about. <laughs> Some relatives fight each other's battles no matter what. Have you heard of the Hatfields and McCoys from the hills of Kentucky? What began as a dispute between members of the two families turned into a feud that lasted for about 30 years. The Hatfields and McCoys, circle this, were taught to fight each other. They were taught that. Year after year, the argument continued, even after the original, the original argument, and just because their name was either Hatfield or McCoy. By that time, they didn't even know how the feud started. Those are some strong family times. But we also have to be wise, don't we? And what we get involved in. You can run and fight someone's battle, and you can be fighting the wrong battle. Maybe they're in the wrong. Oh, I don't want to say that to my family. Have you ever had to say something to one of your family members that was a corrective word? Was it well received? Maybe. Was it well delivered? <laughs> that may be a better question. Goes on to say, talk about Ruth and Naomi. He says, we see how strong family ties were in the biblical story of Ruth and Naomi. We read how the widow Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth stayed together after the death of their husbands and returned to Naomi's home of Bethlehem. We see how God then blessed them through one of Naomi's relatives, Boaz. Let's take a closer look tonight at that story. Naomi was married to a man named Elimelech, and they had two sons, Malin and Kilion. Because there was a famine in the land of Israel, the family moved to Moab. Soon after, Elimelech died, leaving Naomi alone with her sons. The sons then married Moabite women, Ruth and Oprah. Then, years later, both Milan and Kilion died, and the three women were left alone in Moab to fend for themselves. When Naomi decided to return to her hometown of Bethlehem, Orpah, I said Oprah, but Orpah, returned to their parents' home. Oprah was alive back then. But Ruth was determined to go to Bethlehem with Naomi. Now, this is interesting. Let's look at the scripture and see what it says in Ruth 1, chapter 15, or 1, verse 15 tonight. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. She's trying to get her, go ahead and go. It's all right. I'm cool. I'm good. Let's look at 16. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Now, is that a declaration? That's a statement that she's making a fact. She's speaking fact. This is what I'm going to do. In other words, don't tell me again to, to go back to my hometown because I'm not leaving. You're not getting rid of me. Now let's look on. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said, nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The woman asked. And so as we read on, he says, reading further in the story, we know that Naomi did not have a good outlook on the future. In the society in which she lived, it was the son's responsibility to take care of the family members. In Naomi's case, she had no sons to take care of her. Without her husband and sons, she was destitute. There was no social security system, no Medicare system, no welfare system to provide for her. Her only hope, circle that, was Ruth. Her only hope was Ruth, her daughter-in-law who had insisted on staying with her for the rest of her life. Naomi and Ruth had a strong, harmonious, and agreeable relationship. They developed an unshakable relationship, and their kinship provided several things for them. They became partners in life. They had companionship, and they had 
the privilege of sharing material provisions with each other. Let's look at Ruth 2, 2 tonight. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. Now let's look at 23. So Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's field and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in early summer. And all the while she lived with her mother-in-law. Notice that Naomi and Ruth pooled their resources. Whatever Ruth gleaned in the field, she shared with her mother-in-law. Underline this or circle it. They shared their lives together. And whatever one had, the other had. Have you ever had someone in your family, maybe it was a kid, call with a need? They moved out and they need a little money or they need a little help or the bills are piling up or, oh, I forgot about this or the water heater went out. And, and if you're a parent and you have the money, you say what? No. <laughs> if you're Kevin. That was Kevin X, everybody. <laughs> You, would, you know, you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't do what this guy just did. You'd say yes. What kind of person? <laughs> we won't go any further. <laughs> All right, let's move on. All right. <laughs> oh, help us, Jesus. They shared their lives together and, and whatever one had the other had. We must learn to share with our relatives. Maybe we're blessed a little more than they are. It won't hurt us to share with them. We are blessed to be a blessing. Naomi and Ruth also established an agreement in their relationship. Circle this. Living in agreement allowed God to move in their lives and bless them. There may be things in our world. Why is God not moving? Why are we in agreement? Spiritually. Priority wise, these are what these are the priorities. This is what's important. My relationship with God, first and foremost, with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. Of my relationship with them should be primary. Second, my relationship with my family. Sometimes we put work of number two. No, that's out of balance. God didn't design us to put work above our family. He designed us to take care of our family and men to provide for our family. Not that women don't, but it, it, by design, women nature, nurture, men provide, protect. Just by design. In that, we all provide. Amy works full time. I work, you know, full time. You work full time. But in that relationship, if I have extra, am I going to withhold it from somebody who needs it? What's the Bible say that is? If I can help and I don't. That's what it says, isn't it? If I can, and I know I can, and I don't, and I know there's a need, and it's within my ability to do it, I'm sinning. Well, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me that. Well, are you listening? Sometimes we don't want to hear the Holy Spirit tell us certain things. You need to do this and this for something. I don't know. <laughs> Turn the TV up louder. <laughs> Oh, come on now. Let's look at Matthew 18, 19, and 20 tonight. I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will say no. Just like Kevin. No, he said, I'll do it for you. I'm a good dad. <laughs> Kevin's ignoring me now. He's acting like he's looking at the screen, but oh, we go way back, way back. Because God dwells in the midst of those who live in unity, we need to learn to live in unity with our relatives. Because unity is important, you can still have a peaceful relationship with your relative, even if you don't agree. <laughs> can we agree to disagree and still be friends? Is that hard to do in this society? Yes. Definitely. Ruth and uh, have flowed in agreement with her mother-in-law. As a result, they had a place to live and they had each other to live with and enjoy companionship. As I already stated, God made all of us 
to desire companionship with others. If we're married, we enjoy companionship with our spouse. We can also enjoy companionship with our family and our relatives. You can disagree and still be agreeable. Unity is vital to the success of any relationship. We can agree to disagree with our relatives without being disagreeable. We even agree to disagree with Christian brothers or sisters we can without being disagreeable with one another. Underline this. Unfortunately, some people don't understand this principle. As believers, we should be able to overlook things that we disagree with. And, and I'm not saying condone them. Okay? We stand our ground on topics and things that we know the, the Bible is very clear about. But what I am saying is that in our relationships with one another, we may disagree with someone. We can't write them out and write them off because they don't agree with us on some core issue because that may be the lifeline they needed. Remember somebody reaching into your heart at some point, some moment in your life, Maybe you were open, maybe you were vulnerable, maybe you were going through some things and you were just searching for some companionship and some, some camaraderie and, and just some closeness and, and you engaged in that and it blessed you. Now how many of you have tried to battle things on your own? You know, every wedding ceremony I do, I love when people do the, the, the cord the braids during instead of like a unity candle that you know three cords wrapped together the husband the wife God you know it, it, it's it really is that in our relationships with one another it's got to be that there are people that need you to reach into their heart like someone reached into yours there's someone right now in your life that is in need of just being encouraged Maybe, maybe they're in your home and you don't even know it because they hide it well. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe they're so busy and they can play the game and, and give the looks and give the right answers, but deep down they're dealing with some things. Are we available to our family, our, to our friends, to our relatives? Or are we so closed off because we're in such need and we're overwhelmed by so many things that we have no room for anyone else? If that's the case, it's kind of like the Holy Spirit told me last week when I was complaining about some things, just this and that, and he said, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. If you feel that way, you're doing it wrong. Well, that made me mad. Why? Because sometimes you just want to vent, but sometimes the venting gets you in trouble. Sometimes we just need to pray more, complain less, pray in the Spirit more, talk less. Give the devil less to work with. Sometimes we give him a lot. Like Pastor. Remember he did that in the service when he was talking about our words. He fired that thing up. Oh, it's ready to go. Turn it off. Don't they call it a kill switch on some of those things? Shut it down. Why? Because it's no good. Our relationships are going to face disagreement with people we disagree um, I disagree with my sister on a uh, on a uh, uh, an issue to my core but if she's my sister I still love her I can't go well done with you see sometimes as Christians we think if you don't fit into our little then you don't belong well everyone belongs and in our relationship with Jesus, he's placed people in our life that, that right now, as I said a few moments ago, may just need a, a word, a kind word spoken to them. Maybe they need a tank of gas. Maybe they need some groceries. But in it, sometimes when we're upset with someone, I disagreed with them, well, they have need and you can help them. I don't care, I disagree with some things. Well, am I walking in love at that point? So it, it, it's a fine line. You know, there's balance. If people are using us and abusing us, that's one thing. And, and some of us may have that. I've had family 
you know, extended family that can you struggle with sometimes, and, and it's like you have to set firm boundaries, some people. But at the same point, those boundaries shouldn't mean we stop loving. As we go on, he says this. If they happen to disagree with one of their relatives, they have a falling out or a breach in, in the relationship. In some families, that breach is never repaired. Even if you're born again, spirit-filled, and have a wonderful relationship with God, it's important to maintain a good relationship with your relatives. You need to be ready when God opens the door for you to minister to them. And this is not possible if you don't maintain a relationship with them. At other times, you may need help from your relatives. It will be easier to ask for and obtain assistance from them if you maintain a peaceable relationship with them. Perhaps some of your relatives don't have anyone except you to contact them and show kindness to them. It's important for you to maintain relationship with them. If, if It's not necessary to get into strife. If we learn to walk in love and flow in the kind of relationship Naomi and Ruth had, we can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. You know, how is it worded to me one time? <clears throat> Submission is not agreement. There's a difference. We can submit and not agree. And so sometimes we have to understand also, is this battle worth fighting? Who's behind this right now? Is it God? Is it the devil? Who's making me want to reject this person who needs love? God's not going to cause me to feel that way. So I've got to check myself and, 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 and sometimes put on, you know, a more mature self and say, i got to deal with this how God would deal with it. I need to love these people. Anyone ever have to go somewhere with people that you maybe didn't agree with and be in an environment where you had to interact with them for an hour or two and it's uncomfortable. You've thought about it all day. How can I get out of this? Do I have kids I can say are sick? Come on, you're laughing. Don't. Yeah, I know. You know, but in it, sometimes I think we don't realize at that moment We can show them Jesus. And it feels good. When you when 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 you and I are successful in that, we, we you know, we've been there in our life and, and it's like, oh man, it's just because it's hard, isn't it, being around someone it, the, the word says if two walk how can two walk together if they don't agree? So it is hard to be in those interactive moments with people because we're just not going to agree fundamentally. We had to tell someone one time regarding politics, look, we are never going to agree. Ever. Ever. So let's just not talk about it. The same with some other topics. We're never going to agree on that. We can be friends, but it's going to be limited because we're not like-minded in those ways. But but you still love the person. And so in it, I think sometimes when we, we, we run into people who are disagreeable, it's easy just to write them off. Done with you. Well, what if that were for us? You know, I heard a story of, of uh, a professional rock musician that went to rehab. I think I've told you this before. He was there, I think he was there like 16 times. He went to rehab. Didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. Nobody in his life, nobody to help him. And he was doing an interview, and they said, how did you get clean? You went to rehab at that point 17 times. He had, and he, he said, I never went 18. He finally got it. On the 17th time, he finally got it. How many people in your life are on the 17th time? Or the 16th time? And they're getting ready to write them off. They're getting ready to say, that's enough. I've had enough. And they just need one more shot. They just need one more chance. They may be way out in left field. They may be thinking some crazy things, maybe saying some strange things that 
that as believers, well, what are you doing? Where did you get that idea? Hey, let me love on you and help you and show you the truth because you're missing it. You're seeing some things wrong. It goes on to say this, as we do that, we can find favor through relationships. <clears throat> Ruth was blessed through her relationship with Naomi in the sense that she had a partner and friend in life. And because of her relationship with Naomi, Ruth also found favor with Boaz, her kinsman redeemer. Let's look at Ruth 2, 8 through 11 tonight. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. Stay right behind the young woman working in the field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. Think about that. He had heard of what she had done. He saw what she had done for her mother-in-law. He goes on to say that it was the custom in those days for workers to leave behind whatever wheat they happened to drop in the fields as they were harvesting. In other words, if they dropped any wheat, they didn't pick it up. Then those who were destitute could come along after them and gather the dropped wheat and use it for food or take it to the market and sell it for profit. Not only did Boaz create a cocoon of protection for Ruth in the fields, but he also instructed his workers to drop wheat on purpose. So Ruth can pick it up. Let's look at Ruth 2, 15 and 16 tonight as we come to a, a close here. When Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping it. And pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. He was looking out for her. His heart was towards her. Because of the relationship Ruth had established with Naomi and because of the honor she showed Naomi, Ruth obtained favor with Boaz. As a result, Ruth and Naomi received an abundance of food from the field. And Ruth eventually received Boaz as her husband. Underline this. Ruth received all these blessings simply because she had an agreeable relationship with her mother-in-law. Think about that. Ruth's relationship with her relative Naomi put her in a position to become Boaz's wife. It was custom in that day for the nearest relative to marry the widowed woman and care for her. Because of Ruth's loving relationship with Naomi, Boaz, as Ruth's kinsman redeemer, married her and cared for her and her beloved mother-in-law. When Orpah, Naomi's other daughter-in-law, chose to return to her own people, Ruth chose to stay with Naomi. And she not only received the blessings of a close relationship with her mother-in-law, but she also received a new husband through being so closely united with her relative. You may not agree with everything your relatives do and say, but you can find things upon which you do agree. Having an agreeable relationship with relatives will put you in a position of increase. You will be blessed, and you will also be able to be a blessing to your family. Hallelujah. That's a good place for us to stop tonight. We'll take a minute here and close in prayer. And, and, and uh, you know, as we think about these things, we'll, we'll have a few minutes to discuss them here off camera. But great to have these things brought out. Because I think sometimes, have you ever found out the devil's turned you against your spouse or turned your spouse against you? Do you feel like there's, he's trying to get you to end fight? Fight with your kids, fight with relatives. If he can't get you, we said it before, here, 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 he's coming in a way he can. And sometimes it'll show up by us mistreating the people that are closest to us. Well, they know me. They know what I meant. Well, remember, they're a gift from God. Are we treating them as we would want to be treated? That's something that's... Kind of a hard question to ask ourselves. You know, can I put myself, if this were me on the other side of this, how would I feel about what was just said or what was just displayed? 
But I spend days or weeks or months or years with that in my mind because something was said that I just can't. Because maybe somebody said something out of their flesh, out of anger, out of frustration. Remember I said last week we shouldn't treat other people how we feel. We shouldn't treat our family how we feel. We may be feeling grumpy and sleepy and needing a Snickers. But I know this, Jesus never, I never saw that from him in Scripture. So let's just close in, in, in prayer tonight. And, and we've got a lot to think about this week. We have a lot to, to look at kids who may be out there, you know, kids who may be out there doing their own thing, family members doing their own thing, you know. Unfortunately, we, we had a loss here in, in our body. I mean, it's, it's that quick. You just never know. You just never know. You know, I heard somebody say one time, um, they asked someone, well, why, why do you tell people you love them every time? A every time you say, I love you. And they said, because I don't know if I'll see them again. And I never forgot that. You know, and even when we're, Walking out the door, maybe we're upset in the morning, maybe we're, we're behind and, 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 and we're, we woke up on the wrong side of the bed, so, so to speak, and, and we're short with our wife on the way out the door, or we're short with our husband, or there's no kiss, or there's no hug, or there's no affection to our kids. And, and then what happens if something, God forbid, did take place? You know, we should live in a place where we are mindful every day living like this was the last day of our life and to get that mindset and to look at people not as our enemy the devil's our enemy people are not our enemy we make them our enemies by choosing to do so by looking at them at them in a negative light the devil's who we should be upset with he's who we should be taking our frustration out of He's who we should be talking to about things and binding and loosing things according to Scripture. But we shouldn't be taking those things out on our families. And I'm talking to me too. We all get tired. We all get short. You know, if you have pets, if you have kids, sometimes it's a circus. Katie said, amen. Three, three uh, labs, four labs, sorry. Sorry to shortchange your lab collection. <laughs> it is. Well, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this word tonight. We thank you for this time together. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to see our families in a new way. Lord, maybe we're hurt by things genuinely that they've done. And Lord, maybe they did them on purpose. Maybe they tried to hurt us. But Father, we know some things that you've taught us and, and, and help us to apply them, Lord, in a way that would... Help us to be, Father, sin-free. Father, help us, as it's been said, to, to be mindful. Let's, no, let's not let the sin in someone else cause sin in us. Father, help us to, to look through your eyes and see our families the way you see them. We give you praise tonight for a great week. We give you praise, Lord, for helping us to mend some fences this week. And we give you all the glory tonight. In Jesus' name. We all said, Amen. 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 Well, we'll take a